Lisa the Painful was released in December of 2014 after the success of its predecessor, Lisa the First. A full-fledged sequel, the game differs from the premier title of the series in a number of ways, from its presentation, to its setting, and in particular, its story. Lisa the Painful doesn't follow Lisa, but instead her brother, Brad, who's been broken and battered from his traumatic past. Living in a dilapidated country named Olathe, Brad struggles to cope with his trauma for many years until finding something that gives him a reason to live again. When it's taken from him, he pursues it with a fury none in the game's world has seen before. And while doing so, stumbles upon possible answers that could explain what happened to Olathe. Here is a summary of the main story points of Lisa the Painful. Also, there's a mandatory spoiler alert. Obviously, explaining everything in the story will spoil it for you. So if you're intending to play the game, it's best not to continue watching from here. Playing through the game is really the best way to experience it, as the tone and the themes of the game don't resonate as well in the video format. So I would strongly recommend playing the game before watching everything here. Also, this video will only focus on the main story points of the game to make everything a smooth viewing experience, so some of the side areas won't be covered. Now, with all of that out of the way, let's get started. The game opens in darkness, with a smooth, summery song sounding out. But the music is interrupted by beating. Brad begs for it to stop, but the voice in reply tells him to shut up, since the beating is retaliation for their ball being stolen. In an effort to spare the one being beaten, Brad admits he stole the ball, and that Rick had nothing to do with it. A curse is thrown his way, and a violent fury is poured upon him. The darkness is lifted, and a young boy, Brad, lies beaten and battered with others sneering over him, while his friends Rick, Cheeks, and Sticky timidly stand off to the side. Christopher Columbo, the boy holding the ball, calls Brad and his friends idiots, and together with his gents, walks off. Brad stands up, holding his head, while Rick hangs his. Rick sheepishly thanks him, while the others stand in silence. And as he walks by his friends, they apologize to him. Brad passes through his small neighborhood, seeing familiar sights. Mr. Anganelli, Sticky's father, sitting alone by one of the many trees dotted around. Another man mowing his green grass who seems to pity Brad in the dense woods that separate his dilapidated house from the rest of the others. Before going inside, Brad notices a man in a brown suit with sunglasses standing nearby. When Brad approaches, he hears him mutter, Olathe, it's perfect. The man doesn't acknowledge Brad, so Brad returns to his house. He enters where he finds Marty, his father. In his trademark red shirt and signature black sunglasses, he sits alone in the dimly lit living room watching TV. Its eerie sound is shut off as Brad walks in. Marty takes a quick glance at Brad and is disappointed about him returning home beat up. In a fit of anger, he grabs a nearby bottle and hits Brad in the head with it, screaming that he's not buying Brad another shirt. Brad sacrificed his body for his friends. He took the pain so they didn't have to. And instead of being rewarded for his altruism by his father, He's punished, and Marty mutters aloud how he believes Brad is worthless. He orders Brad to his room, then returns his attention to the uncanny television. On his way to his room, Brad checks on his little sister, Lisa, whom he finds sleeping soundly in her crib. After ensuring she's safe, he goes to his room. Still clutching his head, he wanders to the foot of his bed, where he collapses and cries alone to himself. Fast forward a number of years later, and Olathe has changed. A catastrophic event struck the country, killing the grassy fields and luscious trees that used to cover it, transforming it into a wasteland. Concurrently, all of the women in Olathe seem to have disappeared, leaving men as its only inhabitants. With no way to birth more people, the human race seems doomed for extinction. Yet humanity, in its stubbornness, continues. And Brad, now a man, stands alone in this desert. As a child, he was able to escape from his father's abuse, albeit broken and scarred. But his escape left his little sister Lisa alone with the monster that was their father. Left to suffer on her own, 
she couldn't cope with the horrors she endured, and eventually took her own life. Brad feels he abandoned his little sister, and as an adult, struggles with the scars of his past. He's eyeing a little blue pill he holds in his hand. It's a drug named Joy that makes the user feel nothing. Brad uses it to escape the trauma of his past and the guilt he feels over Lisa's death. He downs the pill, and suddenly, he hears something he hasn't heard in years. A baby crying. And indeed, he does find an abandoned baby. He attempts to see it, and after accidentally dropping it to the ground, eventually comforts it. Intending to get it somewhere safe, he carries the baby to his home, where he lives with his childhood friends Rick, Cheeks, and Sticky. They're shocked to see what he's holding, and a realization hits Cheeks. If there's a baby, there must mean there's a woman out there somewhere, meaning there is hope for humanity. He finishes his thought by commenting that she's probably super hot. Rick quiets him down, then asks Brad if the baby is a boy or a girl. Brad hasn't checked yet, so he turns from his friends, checks, and tells them it's a girl. They're stunned by this revelation. Brad is holding the only girl left they know to exist. Rick, understanding the severity of the situation, says they need to tell somebody. Cheeks suggests Rando, and Rick agrees, mentioning he would be better equipped for something like this. But Brad has different plans. He intends to shelter the girl, saying that she wouldn't stand a chance in the world filled with men they live in now. Rick attempts to dissuade Brad from his plan, but Brad remains obstinate, saying he's keeping her even if they refuse to help him. He won't give the baby up, because this is his second chance. He makes a promise to his little buddy that day. He tells her he won't let anyone hurt her. The four men construct a room for Buddy below their hut where they raise her throughout the years. And all the while, Brad still struggles with his addictions. His paranoia compels him to keep Buddy contained within the hut for fear of her discovery, even though she longs to be outside. One day, while Brad is passed out after a binge, Buddy takes her first steps past the threshold of the door. But Brad quickly emerges, and Buddy shoots back inside. As Buddy sits crying in her room, Brad realizes his paranoia and drug abuse is hurting the one whom he loves. So he walks to a nearby cliffside and dumps the rest of his joy pills. He works on making something for Buddy to keep her safe when she wanders outside. He approaches her in her room and shows her a mask he made so she may finally go outside. The two walk hand in hand, finding a white flower in the wasteland that's usually devoid of life and beauty. It's a turning point for them, and the two are next seen with smiles on their faces as Buddy plasters makeup onto Brad. Seeing how happy it made her, Brad grabs Rick, Sticky, and Cheeks and has Buddy do all of their makeup. It's a moment of happiness for all of them, and after the others leave, Brad and Buddy fall asleep. However, Brad still struggles with this trauma of his past, and although he tries to fight it, the pain gets to be too much for him. While Buddy still snoozes, he sneaks out and finds the joy pills he dumped from the cliffside earlier. Although disappointed, he can't help himself and gorges himself on joy and alcohol. Attempting to hide it from Buddy, he does it away from home, leaving her there alone. Brad awakens surrounded by the fruits of his labor, hearing the barking of a dog. He investigates to find it has trapped a man in a tree. The man can't fight the dog because he pulled his groin, so asks Brad to do it. Brad kills the dog using his familial Armstrong style. Afterwards, the man introduces himself as Terry Hintz, the lord of the tutorial. He's been leaving hints all over the world and mentions he's a pretty big deal with a lot of fans. Unamused, Brad begins to walk off, but Terry calls after him, saying he'll tag along with him since he seems so lonely. And thus, Brad gets a new companion. The duo make their way back to Brad's hut, where they find Cheeks slumped over in a pool of his own blood. Brad crouches next to him, and with his dying breath, Cheeks tells Brad she's gone. Brad is saddened by the passing of his friend, but Buddy along with Rick and Sticky are missing. He needs to find them before the worst befalls Buddy in this world of men. 
He tells Terry he's going on alone. But Terry, after getting some information out of Brad, says Brad's going to need someone to protect him, and reluctantly tags along since he's a powerful warrior. And thus, Brad gets a new companion again. Brad follows the kidnappers through a cave at the bottom of the cliffside, fighting through some of the men while passing the corpses of others. Coming out on the other side and passing what seemed to be a vicious, bloody fight, Brad is hit by a Coca-Cola Cola truck, knocking him and Terry unconscious. When he comes to, he finds the bullies from his childhood, the Gents, standing over him. And their leader, Christopher Colombo, comes galloping in on a deer he's named Spaghetti. Colombo fondly remembers the time they spent together in their youth. And so instead of killing Brad and taking all of his stuff, he presents him with a choice. Give up all of his belongings, or give up Terry's life. De depending on the choice of the player, Columbo carries off whichever option Brad chose to forsake, but not before mentioning a rumor that a girl has been seen in the area. After the gents depart, if Brad spared Terry, he fills him in on what happened, and Terry says Brad must be a bad omen. But he likes Brad, and joins him. And thus, Brad gets a new companion yet again. Brad continues his chase until coming to a cut down bridge behind a Coca-Cola Cola truck. When he talks to the man standing nearby, he learns that a bunch of men ran through here talking about a girl when a balding guy in pink and a phallic headed man in green cut out the bridge. It sounds like Rick, Sticky, and Buddy made it across the bridge and cut it down to thwart the pursuit. But then the men says that three dudes with amazing hair found the girl hiding inside the truck. They carried her off to their clubhouse in an old factory and invited everybody. The man says he didn't go because the girl was ugly. Seems like Buddy didn't manage to get away, so Brad needs to find out where this hideout is. While searching the area, Brad continues to be haunted by memories of his traumatic past. In a small village, he has a hallucination in which his father, Marty approaches him holding baby Lisa. Marty simply says, you deal with it, before dropping Lisa to the ground and walking off. When Brad goes to pick Lisa up, he comes out of his vision. There's another moment when he has a flashback to a day he spent at Brick's house before the flash. Throughout the night, Brad sees Rick's home life leaves much to be desired. Rick's wife plainly cares little for him, and his son Junior, who's likely not of Rick's flesh and blood, doesn't respect him, walking out on Rick when he attempts to display his authority. Rick maintains a chipper attitude through it all, but laments to Brad later when the two are alone in the backyard. He wishes he could be more like Brad, and begins listing the things he envies about Brad's life, when suddenly, Lisa appears before Brad and tells him not to forget about her. This shows that Brad was tortured from his past, even before the Flash, and in another flashback, we see how he coped with it. Brad walks up to Sticky and immediately asks for painkillers. It seems Brad has always used drugs to cope with his trauma. Sticky senses something is wrong with Brad and refuses to give any pills to him until he talks about what's bothering him, saying drugs are not what he needs right now. All of these memories paint a picture of the man Brad is today and why he's so vigilant on protecting Buddy. While exploring the outskirts of a small village, he finds a man that invites Brad to play cards with him and his friends in a factory up ahead. When Brad enters the building, it's pitch black. Yet Brad can hear somebody eerily singing about joy. The man lights a lighter, and its flame lights up his face, which shows a sinister smile stretching across it. And he asks Brad, how about you? Light fills the factory, and Brad finds he's not alone with the man. There are many others standing around him with smiling masks upon their faces. Masks that show just how joyful they are. The man seems to recognize Brad, and notices he seems unhappy. He gives Brad some joy, telling him to take care of himself, and that he'll check on him soon. Brad is rushed out of the dark factory, back into the daylight of the world. Confused and troubled from this encounter, Brad barely has time to settle himself before coming upon a grotesque sight. He passed a man earlier that was mumbling to himself, seemingly in a daze. That man has now mutated into some kind of monster, swelling in size with his arm crookedly stretched out in an unnatural fashion. 
and when Brad approaches, it attacks. Brad and his companions kill the monstrosity and curiously find it drops joy. The same drug Brad has been taking for years and given to him by the man a few moments ago. They also come to find that this is not the only mutant around. In the remains of a broken down playground, they find another mutant and sitting nearby is a man. He comments on the mutant's smile, how he's watched it kill dozens, and through it all, it keeps its unsettling smile. Brad and his companions kill the mutant, again finding it drops joy. The man who before looked on the mutant in contempt is now filled with pity. Brad finds a bike on the cliff behind the mutant, which allows him to hop over gaps and will allow him to explore more of the area. One of the areas he explores leads him to a mountaintop, where he sees a man with a polka-dotted poncho playing a trumpet. When Brad approaches, the man stops and looks at him in anger, like he's annoyed Brad interrupted his song. And that's when Brad notices he could hear the song throughout the entire area. Brad leaves the man alone and returns to his search, finding a man that tells him the girl is up ahead in an old clubhouse. Brad finds the clubhouse, but the doors have been locked, and the crowd of men outside are attempting to break in, lamenting their missed opportunity at getting a chance with the girl. Brad manages to get into the building through a hole in the wall on the second floor, and climbs to the top where he finds three men with great hair. They're ready to let Brad get the first go at the girl, but when they see his balding head, they take it as an affront to the magnificent Maine's men's club and attack him instead perishing to the firebombs that burn their way through them due to the vast amount of hairspray in their hair. Brad enters the room where the girl is to not find Buddy at all. It's a man and he explains that he's just a truck driver. The truck by the bridge is his and he confirms the girl did in fact escape across it. He can repair the bridge with tools in his truck if only he is set free. Brad, needing to get to Buddy, agrees to take the man named Farty Hernandez with him back to the bridge. Brad and company finally get to the truck and Farty makes quick work of the bridge. Brad continues fighting through several more men before coming to a small cave where he finds Lisa hanging. She talks to Brad, asking him why he loves Buddy more than her, why he hates her. After all, he's supposed to protect her. She soon fades away and is nowhere to be found afterwards. It was a hallucination driven by Brad's warped mind. Brad continues, killing more men and saving another from a spider. After this, he finally finds Rick, who is bleeding from the stomach and stares at him in wide-eyed amazement. Brad asks what's going on and if he knows where Buddy is, but Rick runs from him. Brad gives chase while Lisa watches from the clifftop. When Brad catches up to him, Rick turns and punches Brad away. He again runs, and this time, when Brad catches up, he tackles Rick to the ground. He ties him to the crumbling utility pole and demands Rick to tell him where his daughter is. Hearing Brad call Buddy his daughter fills Rick with contempt, and he tells Brad she's gone. Rick explains that she doesn't belong to him anymore that they'll be saving the world by using Buddy for repopulation. Brad is upset at this, so Rick asks him what they should do. Should they just die off? Brad doesn't have an answer, so he turns his back to Rick and asks him where Buddy is. Rick answers with silence. Brad tries to understand why, why he took his girl away, which just enrages Rick even more. He screams that humanity has bigger problems to worry about than Brad's little family, that just because he has some pent up guilt doesn't mean the rest of the human race should suffer. He tells Brad it's time to quit being selfish, but Brad is ready to forsake the rest of humanity for his daughter. Defending himself, he mutters Rick doesn't know him, prompting Rick to say he does know Brad is a washed up druggie that isn't fit to raise the most important kid in the world. He knows he's no father. He's an addict. Brad's response changes depending on if the player has used joy at all during the game. But nonetheless, Rick doesn't want to hear it. Brad demands to know where Buddy is one last time, threatening to hurt Rick if he doesn't give up information. 
Rick stoically invites it. Brad, at his wit's end, strikes Rick, his childhood friend, in the face. His determination to find Buddy has turned him against one who he at one time protected. Rick absorbs the blows, never giving up information, and begins taunting Brad. This prompts Brad to pick up a spiked club nearby. He asks Rick not to make this any harder, but Rick just tells him to shut up. Something snaps in Brad. He walks up to Rick and repeatedly smacks him in the face with the club, completely tearing it up. Rick tries to get Brad to stop, but Brad keeps beating him. Rick finally screams that she's with Sticky, hiding in a cave waiting for Rando, but Brad doesn't let him finish. Rick pleads with Brad that he's killing him, but Brad keeps going and going and going until he blacks out. He awakens to a battered and bloody Rick, whom he leaves tied to the utility pole as he figures he's done for. While passing through a dark cave, he hears someone call his name. The lighter is lit, and in the darkness, Brad can see the smiling man and his masked men from the warehouse surround him. The man greets Brad, who asks how the man knows his name. The man answers that they go way back, and is surprised that he doesn't remember him. The rest of the cave is lit up, and the man pulls one of Brad's companions forward. He asks Brad if he loves this person, if he cares about them. He wants to prove Brad has changed and so asks Brad for his arm in exchange for the person's life. Brad has a choice to fight the man, whose name is revealed to be Buzzo in the battle. But if Brad chooses to do so, he is absolutely destroyed by him. So it comes to it, either Brad's arm or his companion's life. Depending on the choice of the player, either Brad's arm is severed to Buzzo's delight, or his companion is killed to Buzzo's disgust. Brad exits the cave where he finds a dying man who offers him his motorcycle, so long as he promises not to wear a helmet since that's lame as hell. Brad hops on the bike, and as he rides through the cliffs as the sun sets, he contemplates all he's seen since he set out to save Buddy. He thinks about the strange mutants he saw, and how they both dropped Joy, the drug he's been taking for years, when killed. Is there something more sinister to Joy? Or does it just help take your pain away and make you feel joyful, just like those masked men of Buzzo's? He then wonders about Buzzo himself, about why he gave him the choice he did, to make the difficult decision between his own pain or his companion's life. He seemed to have delighted in watching Brad squirm over the choice. Does he want to see him suffer? No, that can't be it. He's just like all the other perverted men he's encountered thus far. The ones that only want Buddy to satisfy their sexual desires. He knows that's all they want. Even if they try to disguise it as a noble cause of repopulation. Just like those traitors Sticky and Rick. Their betrayal has made him realize he can't trust anyone. So he'll protect Buddy from anybody. Even those he used to call friend. His thoughts are interrupted when he crashes into someone, throwing him from the bike. As his vision clears, he perceives a truck that is filled with mutilated corpses, their blood leaking from the bed, forming a puddle on the ground, which he now lies in. He then notices soldiers in red are standing over him, but merely watching him, as if awaiting orders. And that's when he notices what he crashed into. A large caped man, wearing a red skull mask. It's the warlord, Rando, and he and his soldiers, seemingly fresh off a massacre, surround the helpless Brad. As Rando approaches, Brad readies himself for a battle. 